Hello, good morning. I, I think we are going to have to get started without the wonderful introduction from Frank. Uh, if we are able to have a few words for him later on, uh, we, will, we will go ahead and get started with that. But thank you all for joining this Business Day Digital Dialogue Conversation in conjunction with MTN. And good morning to everyone. We have a few panelists. Okay. Um, oh, okay, we do have Frank. So I, I will let him do an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is uh, Frank Agbo. I'm sorry for the um, glitch at the beginning. I was struggling to get on to the audio uh, uh, channel. Um, I'm very delighted to welcome you all, ladies and gentlemen, to this very uh, interesting Hi. webinar. We have um, uh, four great uh, guys um, who are experts in their own uh, fields uh, we'll, and will be helping to shine light on some very key issues that we all deal with as business leaders and business executives at a time like this. We will be starting with uh, layoffs, pickoffs, redundancy, uh, and how businesses can navigate these very tiny issues, and then round up with a discussion around managing uh, a workforce from a remote location. Um, these are indeed very trying times, not only for Nigeria, but indeed for the whole world. Uh, but I have absolutely no doubt that our panelists and our able moderator will be able to, uh, 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 you know, make our time this morning uh, something quite uh, uh, useful. Uh, of course, we have Neka Eze, who's um, a partner um, at Dalberg. Of course, uh, Falabi uh, Kuti. Uh, who's in charge of labor relations, is a lawyer at uh, Petstone Grace, and then uh, Adora, uh, who um, is a well-established um, human capital uh, uh, person, and of course, Ezekiel uh, from MTN. Thank you, Frank. I think we will continue. Um, I think there may be some connection challenges that we are all dealing with and we'll have to manage through. Um, I, I think one thing we'll do is start with a bit of an overview in terms of layoffs, pay cuts, redundancy. So really we're trying to understand what are the different options that we have. My name is Neka Eze, I'm a partner at Dahlberg and run our business in Nigeria. It's a global strategy consulting firm focused on a range of topics, particularly around international development. I think we will start with Falabi Kuti and I'll allow him to introduce himself and share a bit um, about your company and experience and then I'll share a few questions with you. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you, Nick. Uh, I, you know, just a bit of technical challenge, but I'll try and make through to see if we can get through. I, I know I have a limited time span to do all of this, so I'll just be brief on the intro. As you rightly said, my name is Falabi Kuti. I have a lawyer, and I am in charge of labor and employment relations desk in Petchton and Grace, where I am also a partner. Good morning, everyone, and I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much, Falabi. I, I think we are going to start with, with the topic. So can you give us a bit of an introduction to the topic, particularly around um, layoffs, pay cuts, redundancies? I think you have um, a legal perspective. Um, can you talk me through the type of legal considerations that need to be taken account, into account as we're thinking about layoffs, pay cuts, redundancy. Okay, all right. Thank you very much again, Ineka. I, I, I'd like to start this way. Um, clearly, in the wake of the ravaging global public health crisis that we're all faced with, businesses are being made to face and try and come up with hard decisions on how they can continue to be in business. And especially when the measures that have been adopted to perhaps check the spread of some of these of 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 of, of the pandemic include a lock-in a lockdown sorry as well as social distancing does making almost impracticable or frustrating the uh, the performance of contractual obligations including employment relations so that invariably has now led business owners businesses entrepreneurs to perhaps look inward and see how best they can manage the situation especially when work, the world of work is practically affected and little or nothing is happening except for perhaps a few things that can be carried on remotely. So 
in making these decisions, and businesses are now being forced to consider various options that are available. And, and, and just as you enter that, um, some are thinking of cutting jobs. I mean, sorry, mass job losses. And what that would inevitably involve is that some of the workforce will be drastically reduced, if not all. Um, redundancy is being considered to be declared in certain instances and all of that. And then um, uh, redundancy layoff. Now, um, for me, looking at it from a slightly different, from the perspective, strictly from perspective of legal consideration as you've had, uh, the starting point will perhaps be what I would call an unsolicited advice as to what businesses should really be considering at this time. Of course, it is available to businesses to try and see how they can cut down on the workforce so that if it is possible to avoid meeting employment obligations and job ben and benefits, which in any, in any event appears to have been frustrated with the ravaging pandemic. So what businesses are those left with is perhaps to cut, uh, to cut down on the workforce. But like I was saying, the also said advice will probably be that businesses should look at what and see how they can reinvent. And if it is possible, post COVID-19, keep the same workforce. Keep the same workforce. However, perhaps consider, that will probably entail is consider quite a number of options that are available on the table. Some of those options include, perhaps um, you want to look at a pay cut. You want to look at deferment on certain obligations that the employer ordinarily hold employees, such as an uh, bonuses, uh, increments in salaries, and uh, promotion, and even perhaps think of considering um, supplanting the two or three weeks lockdown that we are all being faced with, with the ordinary annual vacations that those employees are entitled to. However, <clears throat> and, the reason, and the reason for suggesting this is not far-fetched, um, the portent today clearly show that post COVID-19, there would be, there is likely to be an upsurge in employment related claims, all arising from some of the art choices or measures employers will be taking. Hello, just to be sure that I am still on, I had a little bit. Yes, Falabi, we, we can no longer see your video, but we can hear you. I think you've, you've painted a, a good picture of the initial challenges that people are facing, as well as I think the opportunity to really think through how you can maintain your workforce over the medium term, even if this short term shock is quite significant. Um, Adora is now on the line, so I'm going to pan over to her and then we can come back to you to ask a few questions, uh, particularly when legal advice should be consulted. Um, Adora, can you introduce yourself briefly as well as your company and, and experience? Yes, um, my name is Adora Ikunesi. I'm the founder of Kendo Consulting, a human resources management consultancy firm that focuses on learning and development solutions. Um, of course, my experience is that um, in the last 20 years, um, I've been advising companies on the way forward with regards to maximizing their people efforts. So that's me in a nutshell. Wonderful. Thank you very much for joining. I, I think we're all very keen to hear more. Um, yes. You know, when do businesses really need to start considering these type of measures in terms of layoffs, pay cuts, redundancies? I think mm -hmm. especially given even if we've gone through shocks to the business in the past, this yeah, is yeah. very different uh, than really most people have experienced in quite a long time in terms of the uncertainty, um, in terms of the, the potential medium term economic effects. When do businesses really need to start consider these type of um, measures? Um, the, the thing about it is that businesses have already started considering it. They have been considering it since uh, basically we first heard about the COVID um, virus. So it's been in consideration because anything that will impact business and anything that will cause like such a lockdown as now, there's no end period. I mean, we are like, of course, in Lagos, we're in an initial two week lockdown. But if you look around the world, I don't believe any country has done a two week one. So it's kind of like indefinite. And when there's uncertainty, businesses need to act fast. 
okay, because they can't plan. Uh, businesses plan for the year or five, of course, I mean, longer term, but typically they're working towards a shorter term goal. So all the businesses that have goals for 2020 and beyond, they, 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 the minute there's uncertainty, they can't plan and they need to start making decisions very quickly. So businesses have even gone beyond all those decision making. Right, and I think I just have to mention that a lot of times, uh, this is nothing to do with small business. Uncertainty is uncertainty. If we look at what's happening in the world, in fact, the bigger, the bigger businesses are shocking. <laughs> they're the ones even suffering the more because they're doing more of the layoffs. Um, you have airlines that have laid off 36,000, 40,000 people, one airline. You have, you know, so this is not an issue that is, is a small business problem. It's a business in general problem. And a lot of people don't understand why such a big business or such big businesses are reacting the way they do. Uh, and the truth is that businesses are operational. The minute they stop operating, they don't have liquid cash. Cash is king. And you know, so a business does not have liquid cash. They might have assets. They're still worth billions, balance sheet wise. But even a big business such as an airline needs cash. And if you have airplanes and you have real estate worth billions, but you don't have money, you can't pay your staff. Okay. Mm. So Thank I you, wanted, yeah, I needed to just add that a bit because a mm. lot of people don't even understand why big businesses are reacting. It's not a small business thing, it's a business thing. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. I think that's clear. I think the the advice around both acting quickly as yeah. well as really understanding your cash flow situation is very well yeah. understood. I yeah. think now the question is, okay, you've understood there's a big challenge, a shock to the system. Yeah. You are trying to act quickly and you're looking at your cash situation. Yeah. Tell me a bit more about the actions that you can take. So if you look at, for example, pay cuts, yes. Are yes. They, when should they be considered? Yes. So the thing is that, first of all, I would say if you don't have a cash flow situation and your company can afford it, this is not an option that I would advise that you take now. One, it's a very difficult period for everyone. So it shouldn't be your first option. And I would say that to every business. If you can absorb it, try as much as possible to absorb it. Because the truth is that there will always be bumper seasons and there will be farmings. You know, just take this as a, a, you know, a period in time. Doing nothing is an option. And please, if you, you can, take that option first. Now, if cash flow is a big issue and you can't, then you have the options of pay cuts, okay? A pay cut is obviously that your staff will take a lower salary than before for the period. However, bear in mind that anything that you're going to do at this time should be negotiated with staff. Just like Afolabi was saying, you need to think about this time, not just because of litigation, people are human beings. They also had plans. It's quite unfortunate that this is happening, but anything we're doing, please bear in mind that you're dealing with people and their feelings and emotions. So you have pay cuts as an option. You have, of course, you, you have an option of laying off staff. Layoffs could be temporary or they could be permanent. And then of course there's redundancy. So I'll take it in the first order. Pay cuts is just a reduction in salary. Now you can use the pay cut option by, of course people can continue as normal, but we know that a lot of businesses can't continue as normal, meaning that they will have less work to do. So you can renegotiate your pay cuts with less hours. So the person feels like they're doing a part-time job as opposed to a full-time job. So you would renegotiate the hours and you can drop the pay. If you need someone to be working full-time and you want to reduce the pay, I think you really need to have a very sensitive discussion and make sure that you get that person's buy-in. So pay cuts would be, you know, employees are very sensitive now. So trust me, any negotiation is welcome. No one wants to lose their job now because they can't even get another job with another company. So pay cuts will be an option that, trust me, you speak to your employees, they will be on board. Now layoffs can be temporary. The sad thing is that some businesses, they can't even do a pay cut option. They have to, they don't have work for the staff. So they might need to lay off temporarily until they can call people back when operations resume. For that option, the staff would have to go on something similar to unpaid leave. Um, but guess what, companies, you can also still pay your staff. Um, you can pay them benefits, you can ensure that they still get benefits, or you can pay a stipend. You can pay, you know, 10%, 20%.
50%, it's affecting everyone in the world. Like there's no sports, there's no entertainment. The footballers are on half pay right now. Like everyone will understand. So you can negotiate a pay, a pay cut or, a, or a layoff, a temporary layoff with benefits that work for the company. And then redundancy, the third option is quite different because when you declare, a, you declare a role redundancy, not a person per se. For you to take the redundancy role, what you're saying is that that role no longer exists. Okay, so if it's an operational shortage, then what you need is probably like a, a, a temporary layoff or a pay cut option. Because redundancy means that you have to be able to prove that the role is now redundant. And, you know, a lot of uh, litigation comes from when people, uh, companies lay off people and they say they make them redundant. And the next thing we see, they're recruiting. You're open to litigation if the role wasn't really redundant. And redundant means that for a role to be redundant, it means you had excess capacity, that you eliminated that role altogether. And that maybe you've now shared the role into other roles. You have to have proof of that. So those are your options. Um, but what I would always say is, Please don't carry out your options independently. Ask people's opinions, what they think. People are always shocked what staff can come up with. You know, you might be thinking 50% pay cuts. Your staff can come up with 25%. They can come up with 75%. They might even come up with, you know what? There's nothing here, so let's just even volunteer. So I would say consultation is your biggest tool right now. Don't think it's, don't try to do it by yourself. Don't think this is just us management doing our own thing. Open it up. You'll be shocked what kind of advice will come from your staff. So I hope I've been able to. You yeah, know, um, I, I think it's been very helpful yeah. just to yeah. clarify what are the different options that you might consider. And I, I think we started yeah. with, if you can, perhaps don't take one of these options for now, yeah. Yeah. then consider different options in, discussion with your your team and um, mm -hmm. whether that's pay cuts whether that's layoffs or redundancies one mm -hmm. question that's coming up in the q a section and, and all to all the participants please feel free to drop your questions in the q a so we can can track them one question is that um it seems like there's a question about annual leave and yeah, sort of yeah. people either being asked to take annual leave yeah. or sort of being required to take annual leave when they weren't planning to can you Talk through a little bit the HR Definitely. considerations around that. Definitely. Now, you see, the first thing, annual leave comes with, because when the staff is on annual leave, you're still paying them full time. Okay. So you would take this option if you had liquidity and you could afford to. So what you're saying is that go on leave now, but, you know, we're going to need you later on in the year, but take your leave now. You're going to take your leave with pay. So... It's a softer landing for people who can afford to now. So they're encouraging, companies are encouraging people to take their annual leave now. Because if, these, this, if we're going to be in, in this situation for another couple of months, we need all hands on deck later on in the year. So it's a first option, but it's not an option that is going to save the company money in terms of cash right now, but it's going to ensure that you have your workforce you know, fully ready to work in later time. So it's a first, it's a, a good option. Mm -hmm. But some businesses, it's not an option for them because annual leave it means that they still need to pay you and they, yeah. and they come. Great. Yeah, Thank you. That, yes. Thank you very much, Adora. Falabi, I see you're back uh, with us. And there's a yeah. many of the questions in the Q&A really are focused on the, the legal questions. Yeah. Um, I think one of them is really a question about um, what can sort of businesses do that's really in line with the law, um, particularly around things like compensation, um, around laying off employees, for example. Um, there is a question about, do you know of any company that's carried off layoffs successfully in Nigeria? Um, and then how is the law protecting employees is another question that's come up. So there's a whole range of, of tax considerations, I think, would, uh, sorry, legal considerations that have come up. I think it would be helpful if you can share with us your reflections on what the legal considerations um, are, and then also when a lawyer should be consulted on these type of issues. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, okay, let me, let me start this way. I think I was on that before uh, Adora came in, and thankfully, Adora has actually examined uh, that aspect where I, 
how be it from the HR perspective. The HR perspective would also now need to take into consideration the legal consideration around the number of these things. Now, she's absolutely right as to uh, if it is possible, businesses should look at absorbing, absorbing the same workforce, but think of measures that both parties can, that workable, let me just put in workable measures. Now, this is where law comes in. In thinking of workable measures, you need to perhaps go back to the drawing board and look at the contract of employment and the employment manual. Mm -hmm. The uh, contracts and employment and the employment manual, those are the starting point because like every other written contract, employment is just one, is just a contract, it's a species of contract. And the employment contract and the employment man or the manual, uh, the handbook or manual, whatever it is called, must always be taken into consideration whenever a decision or decision making processes in employment relations would happen. Um, having said that, I can well imagine it would not, it is not unlikely that when you come through this employment contracts or the manual, the unprecedented crisis that we have and the measures that have been adopted to deal with them, there's a lockdown, employ, employees cannot go to work, uh, there's social distancing, employees cannot even <laughs> relate if they're able to go to work. Yeah. So, and it is not unlikely that this contract never envisaged that there will be a time when measures like this would come into play and ineffectively will frustrate the performance of such contract. So this is where the new jurisprudence that labor and employment in Nigeria preaches comes in. And what I mean about that is that a lot of what we're talking about, what employee, employers need to know is that it is no longer a unilateral decision. For example, um, when you talk about annual leave, annual leave in some, in some businesses, they are already fixed. Perhaps they are taking it in August, perhaps they're taking it um, at a particular period in time. I mean, for some reason, we are now thinking that, can they think of, I mean, discussing with employees to supplant this two, three weeks lockdown for the annual leave that they are to take in the future. Um, and in such, what is important? It is possible. However, there is a process that must be followed through. There's a procedure it must go through. In the past, it probably would have been a unilateral decision of the employer coming into play to say, well, you were to have it in August, but it is no longer possible. We would let you have it now, continue, considering the fact that the employment obligations and that I should, the employer should really make, is still bound to make them anyway. So what he wants is a situation where in the future, rather than employees being kept at home now, and then in the future, it comes around to say, I want to go on and, and I want to go on a, on a leave. Mm -hmm. There is bound to be, so there is bound to be a drastic effect on productivity. So what employers should be doing now is having a discussion with employees. Why do I say discussion with employees? The new jurisprudence is actually flagged by what international labor organization has called a social dialogue. It is no longer for the employer to just uh, unilaterally fix what is the process and then take it back. And then even in Nigeria. Um, we now have, um, in a few cases, the courts have increasingly said, employment relations is now about participatory democracy. So you can continue to renegotiate. The contract has said this when you were coming in. But when there are unprecedented crises as of this, you need to go back to the employee, perhaps through the union, perhaps through a body that represents them, to perhaps look at measures that you, you can apply, that you can bring to play to ensure that the job continues or the workforce, you do not need to cut them, you can continue to absorb. And yeah. even, even and when you Olabi, given, given the time, I think we are going to move on to the second topic. I, I think there's a, many questions in the q and I don't know that we can get to all of them, but you've started to really answer the key questions. And I think, you know, un unfortunately, at a time like this, there's a question about whether or not um, you know, we are able to take advantage of some of these different options, or if we should. I think there's a question uh, somebody asked, you know, what if, for example, people refuse to a pay cut? Um, obviously, a pay cut is a bit of a conversation. Some of the other decisions really do mean that there is significant strain on the business. Um, and I think we can come back to this at the end in, the, in terms of the q and I do want to, to move on to the second topic for today in order to give us some time because there are people 
very interested in that. And then we'll come back to the legal and HR conversations around, as we said, layoffs, pay cuts, and redundancy. Thank you very much, Falabi, for the reflections and to Adora. Thank you. We'll now move over to managing a remote workforce and achieving efficiency through technology. I think in a way this topic is very related to the first in that there's a question about how can businesses really adapt during this time and, and still be able to conduct what business they can, but really looking at remote work, particularly given this period of lockdowns and given what we've seen in other countries globally around how those lockdowns can affect business and how they can persist. So uh, Ezekiel, can you please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your past experience, particularly around managing a remote workforce? Thank you and um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Ezekiel Bamiboya. I work with MTN. I am a salesperson, so I'm a professional salesperson. Um, I've been managed remotely um, at the beginning of my career, and um, I've been managing people remotely for about 10 years. And you would agree with me that the organizations that I've seen ahead of time um, to, in, to infuse into their business continuity plans um, such um, opportunities for employees to be able to work remotely have an edge as we speak. So while it's important that we we'll have this discussion now, after COVID-19, we're hopeful that organizations will look inwards and see how they can actually build some resilience into their organizations for the future. Um, it is just important that um, you must think about how to work without physical contact. Um, some of our managers are used to seeing people in the morning, greet them, good morning. They're used to calling people physically to dish out direction, information, all of that. But then, yes, the world is not just becoming a global village. It is already a global village. And as it's smaller in nature, it's also becoming so distant in reality. And therefore, digitalization, and leveraging technology becomes so very, very important. Yeah. Can you tell me more, what does it mean to manage a remote workforce? Does it mean that you have all of your staff in different locations, or in your case, perhaps before the lockdown, you had some staff together with you, some apart, but what do you mean by remote workforce? Okay, so the different levels of remoteness, if you allow me, built into um, workforce in general. So you have some people, um, the frequency of physical contact with your employees might just be once in a week. Uh, maybe it's just a branch down the road. It's a level of remoteness. Um, there are some people you hardly not see them because you're probably not in the same city. Um, maybe your boss is in Lagos, you are in Ibadan. Maybe once in a month you get to see. There are some organizations that the most senior person in the department won't get to see um, the guys in the, in the field until maybe once in a year. That's some other levels of remoteness. There are some organizations that you have employees in other countries. Probably years you don't even get to have physical contact. So in a nutshell, um, managing workforce remotely talks about the level of physical contact that you would have with those employees. And if you don't have that much frequency built into that fiscal contact, then you need something to actually replace the fiscal contact that I should have had. Okay, thank you for that. I think it's helpful just to hear the range of options, particularly as people think about not just now, but also as we move forward, I think there's a lot of things people are learning about how to do this remote work. Um, and so wondering if you can talk us through the different technology sort of options or rather how technology can actually support the efficiency around remote work, how you and your team have been able to leverage technology, for example. Okay, thanks. Um, so leveraging technology is not a one size fit all, even where you have applications and solutions um, all, all across the, the, the space. What happens is there's a need to understand your own organization. So you should have an idea of your touch points end to end. You should understand your pain points end to end. That is the only reason you can begin to build in what I call expansion joints to help bridge the gap. So I'll use my company as an example. I'm a salesperson, I oversee about seven states, so I have employees in seven states of the country. 
Now, I know what they do. These are guys that wake up in the morning and they go look for businesses for MTN. So what should I do as the leader? The first thing is to be sure that they have information. Information is key. So how do you move information to them? The next thing is to be sure that if there's a little change in your space, that change will be passed down the final mile. In some organizations, changes don't occur that frequently. In telecoms, um, uh, it's per second. So you must build a workforce that gets information on the go. You must build a workforce that is knowledgeable. You must build in a, a workforce that has insight. These are little things that actually create edge for company A over company B. So the type of technologies to use is basically driven by what you intend to achieve. And number one on the list is communication. So, and communication as simple as having voice communication through SMS, through WhatsApp, and all of that. It is important you build that in. How do you have effective communication going on? Unfettered communication with your team. The different solution. A closed user group solution, for example, will help yourself, your team, your stakeholders have that ease of communication on the go. You don't want a team member, a critical resource, to say, I'm sorry, I ran out of airtime. So how do you leverage whatsoever it's solution built in um, into um, technology to help you bridge that gap? A closed user group will do that. What about data? So now we say data is king, data is the new oil. How do you use that data of information and data which is access to information to bridge gap between the person that is the leader and the person that is maybe a, a team in the workforce, you have to look for a solution that helps to create access for accessing information. And one solution that is also available is you having a group data share. A group data share can help you fix that solution. Um, unlike where I have to buy data myself and I'm telling you, I'm sorry, I'm out of data. An organization that thrives on disseminating information would make sure that that employee, that workforce team member has access to all of that. And a couple of- um, we're, getting, uh, we're getting some Q&A, which um, suggests that a number of employers are requiring staff to actually you know, take on this cost and, and they're finding it quite difficult, particularly given, you know, at least at this time, there's also spending on fuel. There's you know, significant sums being spent on data uh, what's your reflections uh, for somebody who's in that situation or how do you counsel employers around managing the costs around remote work? I think particularly because for many people, it's a strong transition versus those who are already practicing remote work. So for employers who are new to remote work, what's your advice around managing some of those costs uh, uh, and having that conversation with their employees? Okay, thank you. Uh, so you agree with me that um, organizations that still need employees to work remotely as we speak in this instance, um, this is because we're forced to work remotely. Let's assume we are, weren't forced to work remotely. The cost benefit analysis of working from home and the organization putting in place all the infrastructure and facilities for those employees to work in the office tilts towards a net plus for working remotely. And that would mean that if you check the cost of running your generators for lighting, for cleaning, for all of that, and the employee working from home or remotely, you would see a net loss in favor of the organization. So it's in you getting to allocate some budget for that, allocate budget to relieve those uptake in the cost that the organization should have. But in this instance that we're forced and some organizations have actually not made plans for this. It's for you to sit up and actually do something in the meantime. Then after COVID-19, you build all of this into um, your business continuity plan. And thank you very much for the reflections. I think it's very worthwhile. And we've started to talk a bit about cash flow during the first session. And I think in this session, really looking at what are those costs um, that you're saving in terms of moving your 
your workforce to a remote workforce. Um, what are the types of things you actually need to keep in mind as you're thinking about managing your team? I think you hinted at some previously around how do you keep in touch, um, but what are some of those downsides around managing a remote workforce and what are the ways that we can actually get around some of those downsides as you're managing a remote team? Okay, thanks. Um, managing a remote team first and foremost needs very strong leadership. Um, a remote team doesn't presuppose that there's no leader. And that would mean that somebody is leading that team and there's no ambiguity about who that person is. Secondly, you don't leave room for guesswork. So there must be very clear KPAs and KPIs. Key performance areas must be very clear. Key performance indices, measuring those areas must be very clear. Everyone must understand what everyone needs to do. No one must think anyone can do anything. Everyone must have what they should do. It must be very clear. Now, the processes we build into working physically, things like approvals, you must also clearly state how you intend to leverage technology in getting those approvals done. So you don't just suspend a process, you build observers into those processes such that you can always say critical success factor when you come in working remotely. And another point is performances in every area of work that are on track can be assumed not to be done. So you must track performance. Writing reports does not need too much. It's just leveraging again technology. Microsoft Teams, for example, can help you drop your report somewhere, somebody articulates and consolidates those reports, and you have a picture of what is being done in daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. And I think I want to mention the fact that it's extremely important to also build in fun when you're working remotely. You know, we're used to having, thank God it's Friday physically, we're used to having all those engagement, but when people work remotely, more, more often than not, you need to look for a way to build in fun. On the platforms that you use, whether it's WhatsApp or anything, you create, you gamify things. When you drop activities, you gamify those activities. The first five people to do X, Y, Z stand to win something. You infuse energy into the team. If you get all these things up and running, people won't really feel they're working remotely because then there's a virtual community that is coming together trying to achieve the collaborative objective. Great. Thank you so much. I think there's a range of questions being asked about, you know, I guess one is what platforms should they be using? There's another question about how do you think about things like security and, and sharing of information? Um, and so want to get your, your reflections on that. Um, I know there's a range of options out there. Yes, so um, one thing I, I, I didn't mention earlier is when you work remotely, you must have trust. Even while you were working physically, um, people will breach. So how do you build in processes to still protect the organization? And so you can have your VPNs, your vi virtual private networks to give access to those that um, should have access to specific platforms within the organization. Um, but then you must trust people to do what they should do. You must empower them to do what they should do, but trust them. Then the next thing is you must build a highly disciplined workforce. Um, if you don't do that, um, you're definitely going to have so many people on the loose. So trust on one end and discipline on the other end. Then use technology to protect the organization from the back end. That's the much that you can get done. Great. Thank you so much. I think one of the things that we've been realizing is that um, those social interactions and connections are very important to maintain during this remote work or work from home period for a number of companies. And so finding ways to almost uh, recreate the office environment through the remote work can be can be helpful. I think making sure that people are equipped, as you were saying, and um, really taking into account the cost to company that is being saved um, with the remote work situation. I think one, one question that came up was, which is quite interesting, was that 
you know, the argument on the employee side is, is actually being made that, okay, well, employees are saving on transportation costs, and so they should bear some of the costs of, of the data. I don't know if this is a conversation you've had with any of your team, but it would be great to hear your reflections on, on that question, and then we'll um, move over to, to the Q&A as well. Okay, so let, let me just respond to, to that quickly. And uh, again, organizations that can absorb as, um, as much cost as possible should absorb it. Um, I know in Lagos, for example, so many organizations have um, staff buses to commute um, their staff members to and fro the office. Those staff buses are grounded as we speak. Again, what's the cost benefit analysis for your organization? No two organizations are the same. So you won't compare your organization with the other organization because your costs and the benefits are quite um, different. So if my employees are currently sitting at home and my drivers are not on the road, my 200 buses are not on the road, I'm not paying for diesel, I'm not paying for petrol and all of that, um, again, net is to the organization. But where you have organizations that do not have that before now, probably you weren't paying um, transportation allowance, then you would think that these guys are saving on, on, but overall, I think organizations that are empowered to do a little more um, should just try as much as possible to do that. Great, thank you very much for the, the reflections, I think particularly around Look, we're all managing through a very difficult and as I noted at the beginning, different time uh, in the world and then particularly for Nigeria. I think both because of the immediate impacts of COVID-19 and the global pandemic, but also from at least the projections around what the economy is going to look and feel like throughout 2020. So I think what all of this conversation for me is a reflection on the need to really work together as employers, as well as employees on different solutions that will work. And really trying to manage through, given this difficult time to still deliver and be efficient at the work at hand um, as much as possible, right? You obviously have to take into account the constraints of operating during this environment. There's a number of companies who are not able to, for example, work from home and so might have different considerations. I, I see a whole range of questions in the q and I think some of them, we likely won't be able to answer over the next 14 minutes or so, but we'll, we'll try and come to sort of as many questions as we can. And um, I think we'll actually go back to the first uh, round of conversation around layoffs, pay cuts, redundancy. There's a, a range of questions around this. Um, one that actually came off, came, came through is actually, um, you know, there's some conversation about should there be an HR strategy that sort of is, is built for this time. Um, so maybe at first you do minor pay cuts and then what if this period continues for six or nine months? What do you do over time? Does it make sense to have a strategy that's documented or is it better to be a bit more flexible? And um, was one question that came up. I think another question is, you know, as much as we started to talk about the annual leave um, use, a number of people asked about employee motivation um, questions, and I think this is both around if you're having your staff take annual leave, and then we're, we'll come back, uh, Ezekiel, to you around keeping remote staff motivated, but motivation has really come up quite, quite strongly. So I'll, I'll let Adora and Falabi answer some of the questions around the HR and, and HR legal implications, and then we'll come back to the remote workforce questions. Okay. All right. Um, um, thank you very much. So my first, um, you know, my response to that would be typically, I mean, if, even if you look at contracts, especially a lot of the small organizations, they, they didn't even make provision for redundancies or pay cuts. So a lot of policies don't actually cover this, to be very honest. Now, whether we should have it is, is fine, I mean, but the problem with having a policy around it is, Still, what is driving these changes are the operations, like how much money the firm has. So if we put a policy in place around this and we don't follow it, then we'll be going back on ourselves. So I would say that for small businesses, because this is an SME dialogue, now if they put a policy, 
I think the policy should be flexible and would say that management will try as much as possible to work with employees and consult them. I think that would be a good policy to have. So tell them through the process of what will be done in terms of consultations between management and staff. Rather than saying hardline that, you know, of course you make a commitment. Remember policies are based on philosophies. So the firm already has values and those philosophies and values will be evident in the, you know, the handbooks, the, you know, the policy, let them know the heart of the organization. So I would focus on the spirit of it, that these will be done in consultation so that you're not held and said, oh, you said you were going to keep us for three months first and you didn't, or you said you were going to. So I would want us to be, you know, focus more on the, the, the you know, the values of the firm and not be yeah. so hard lined. Um, Another question yeah. that came up before we get to the remote work conversation um, is that there seem to be differential pay cuts being offered. So one question came up that, you know, junior staff are the only ones having their pay cut, but senior staff are still on the same pay. <laughs> um, you know, how do you address this? Another question came up quite strongly was, okay, we hear you. These are very good suggestions, but how do we actually pass on this message to employers? particularly those who really want to, to may perhaps take advantage of this situation to, yes. uh, to require pay cuts. Yeah, I think, you know, obviously this is the time to show the spirit of the firm. Um, to be very honest, I mean, if you are going to take things into account, like I couldn't, the spirit of the firm now at this hard time, if you're given someone who's on 40,000 Naira a pay cut, I really don't know what you expect them to, to do. So the truth is that what I would say is that this is a time to be human. Um, organizations, management, if, if you're going to carry out uh, these kind of things, I think you should be more benevolent at the bottom, considering that you know, people pay at the bottom. And I believe that this is my own philosophy, that pay costs should start at the top and not at the bottom. But sometimes um, we think that management is not having pay costs, but it's because of the information that is not trickling down. So I think firms will benefit more from open communication. A lot of the communication is not open. So in some firms, the management is actually doing quite a lot, but they don't know. Like the, the rest of the firm, the employees do not know what management is sacrificing. This is a time for management to be open and communicate with their teams. You know, when there's consultation, I think all this would be would be resolved. There's nothing you cannot resolve by dialogue. And I think companies should focus more on dialogue. Thank you. I, I think it's a very helpful reminder, particularly at a time like this. I think the uncertainty yeah. is so strong. And I, I also think we you know, have not really experienced something like this uh, yeah. for many years. And so I think it's a helpful reflection to still let employees see the human side of the organization and really have the culture show through because at some point we will get through this. Um, and so there's a question about how do you really maintain that loyalty and motivation. Yeah, Falabi, yeah. We're, we're getting a number of le legal questions about force majeure. Um, particularly, is this something that can be employed because people have seen it employed in sort of vendor and other contracts? Is that something that can be employed in employee contracts? And um, so I would love your perspective on that, if, if it can actually be used in employment contracts. Uh, uh, Thank you again. Uh, yeah. um, I'm going to turn to the question related to the force majeure. Yes, the force majeure. Uh, sorry, Falabi, I believe you might have multiple logins. Okay, yeah. oh, sorry. Maybe phone and. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because it was actually tripping off at some point. Okay, okay. we can hear you now. Perfect. I think it's better now. Fantastic, yeah. So, like I was saying, force majeure in itself, it's a principle that operates to suspend or excuse or terminate the performance of a contract because of a set of um, uh, a set of activities. It could be human, it could be natural, and invariably we call act of God that was not contemplated that could ordinarily come into um, suspend or not make the contract to be workable. Now, um, of course, the question of calling force major in aid to say it is impracticable to perhaps go on with the enforcement or the performance of obligations of employment contract can be resorted to. However, 
there is a, a, a there's a caveat, and uh, what I mean is like um, it must be it has been contemplated and it is expressly provided for in the contract of employment between parties. So first, my job would ordinarily not be calling aid unless it was contemplated and in the contract of employment between parties, it had actually been expressly stated. So in the absence of that, what you can perhaps call on is a common law of frustration. But to my mind, I don't even think that is so much of an issue as much as the overall principle or philosophy that now drives labor relation, which I think is very important that we bear in mind at every point in time. Initially, I was talking about the portents are clearly that post COVID-19, there will be an upsurge in employment related claims. And of course, a, a company that has just barely, or a business that has just barely managed through the stress of COVID-19, would only not want to be bogged down with a huge portfolio of contingent liability or claims arising from employment related claims and the green prospect of some of these claims being established and then the company is made to pay heavy damages. Now, talking about that, how would that be, or how can that come to play? Um, employment law today is not what it used to be about 30 years ago. So perhaps if it was there that this had happened, we probably would have been looking at a labor court that would be constituting an obsolete labor act that was made in 1974 and did not contemplate social economic realities that we're dealing with. The labor court that we have today, and um, they were being created and empowered through an amendment to the constitution, which we all know is the supreme law of the land. So in adjudicating between parties to look at what happened elsewhere, to look at international best labor practices. I'm talking about that. Earlier on, Adora made mention of uh, British Airways laying off some people. Of course, British Airways in the course of the week or last week, perhaps still are, are looking at measures that could be to look at some of these issues arising from uh, frustration of the employment contract, had a meeting, an extensive discussion with 30,000 workers, 30,000 workers, and it was an extensive discussion that went across almost two weeks. The unions, the individual staff were necessary, and they came, up, they came down to having a discussion that uh, agreed of having a pay cut of 80%, sorry, of 20%. So in April, their workers would only be entitled to 80% of what ordinarily should have been a take-home pay. Now, what does that tell us? That is what obtains in the UK. But I can tell you that the labor court today, the UK and Nigeria is, the difference is Lagos and Ibado, or Lagos and Abuja. So they, they are free to look at what happens there and then look at the process that has been employed. That you are discussing pay court. An employer cannot just wake up and apply pay court without having a discussion with the yeah. union. Yeah. Without yeah. having I a think... discussion in the aspect of the union. Yeah. Yeah. So that is the I point that, that I make about that. I think it's clear. I think in a way you started to hint at um, the fact that COVID-19 is so new and likely is going to affect the way we think about contracting and labor laws going forward globally. So I think it is something, you know, unfortunately, we're all as employers as well as employees bearing a bit the brunt of having not planned for this. Um, yeah. And I imagine there will be significant changes coming forward. Adora, one question that's coming up is, is really around what happens when the conversation break, well, first, how to have the conversation. So somebody says, I have a workforce that's you know over 150, 150 people. They're situated all over the country. How do we even engage in this conversation is one. And then two, what happens if a conversation breaks down? So we've asked our staff to go on annual leave. They've refused, now what do we do? Yeah, I mean, the, the truth is that this is, this is a very special time for everyone. And this is the time that even, uh, you know, organizations, this is new to organizations and it's new to, to the staff as well. Dialogue, I think if there's anything I need to stress now is those conversations. And those conversations are much harder now. Um, the best organizations are the ones who started the discussions two weeks ago. I remember when we started talking about layoffs, uh, some people thought it was too early, but the best organizations could see and have all their staff in meetings two weeks ago. Right now, if you want to have any conversation, unfortunately, you have to do it remotely, which is the most difficult thing to do. But guess what? It's your only option. Arrange a Zoom conference, a Zoom meeting. You need to do it. 
This is the time for management to be transparent. This is the time for you to be honest with what is actually happening. Because if there's a breakdown in dialogue, you can't reach an agreement, and then other clauses of contracts will now need to be. If you can't reach an agreement with someone, then you have to terminate the contract. And if you terminate the contract, it means that you have to pay off the employee. Um, if you're trying not to save money now, you know, this is going to be much more difficult. So bear in mind that um, employees are human beings. If you speak to anyone and tell them your situation, you'll be shocked. They'll be very understanding. Companies don't keep money. I, I was trying to have this conversation yesterday. Contrary to what people think, companies don't just stash money in the bank and do nothing with it. They have shareholders. End of the year, they share profits and they use quite a bit of that profits into capital intensive projects. They don't have liquid cash like that, no matter how big the organization is. So speak to your employees about the books. If you're a small organization, you may know how much you have left for payroll. You may know that practically you only have one month left of payroll to do. Tell your employees, with this one month I have left, how do we manage it, considering that we may not be able to work for two or three months? Your employees know that if you can't work for three months and you're going to save one and you only have one month in cash, it means that all of us have to take a 30% pay cut so that we can spread it through. They're not going to expect you to go and borrow money from the bank or anything. You need to be realistic and true. If you're a business leader, you work for a small firm, this is the time you're going to make sacrifices. You know, I'm talking to small business owners now. You're going to be the person who's not going to earn anything now. <laughs> and so, so practically, you have to... These are the sacrifices we make as leaders. So this is what you do now. So yeah. the issue Thank is you. Adora, I think we're, yeah. we're just running up on time. Yeah. Ezekiel, I did want to give you an opportunity to, uh, to answer this question about motivation, which has come up. Um, you know, it is a very different time. I think there's both some psychological impacts in terms yeah. of all the news around COVID, the uncertainty that people are feeling and experiencing. Can you share any thoughts that you've had in terms of managing remote workforces, keeping up the motivation, and then addressing some of those psychological sort of elements around COVID-19. Yeah, thanks. I would share with you what, um, what happened in MTA. And um, um, so every, every level of leadership is trying so hard to give a lead to into the emotional bank of every employee. And you're not looking at um, senior executive only. Um, for example, yesterday, the, um, the CEO, the CEO, the head of HR in MTN had a conference call with all the employees, just trying to reassure them, checking up on them, and letting them know that we're going to go past these together. Now, at regional levels, you see regional heads also trying to organize such, keeping touch with the people, asking them, how are they feeling? Uh, in MTN, every day you're asked, are you having any feeling of, um, of, of, of let's say, um, feverish feeling? Do you have headaches? Do you have cough? Every single day, just to tell you that we're concerned about you, I want to nip this in the board as early as possible. But then checking up on the final man, um, the man that is the farthest to the past that be, is the responsibility of every leader around that person. Um, this is a time that we all need to leave our comfort zone by reaching out to those employees. You probably are not their, their, their direct line. You want to check a list of people, place a call to them, ask them how they are feeling. Um, it goes a long way in building the, the motivation that they have. And remember again, um, COVID-19 has come, but it would go. How would you leverage the opportunity to build in that loyalty into the workforce such that when this is all gone, you see them repay the organization with such loyalty that is built during the process? And I think it's very helpful reflection, Ezekiel, particularly in this time. Um, personally, I found myself becoming a better manager of people um, in this time, and the hope is that we can actually use this time to improve in that interpersonal side of things and make sure that teams are really able to manage through. And um, I think as Adora and Falabi hinted at and mentioned, culture is, is quite an important piece of this. So making sure you can maintain that through this period of time is quite important. 
Uh, Falabi, I'll go to you for closing thoughts and then to Adora. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, okay, two things. First is, which I think has resonated in virtually what I've said. Uh, the running trail is that there's a need to continue to engage employees. These are unprecedented times, never contemplated that this would happen. And I can assure you do not have provisions in most employment and contract handbook. So we need to constantly engage because the time of unilateral decision being taken by employer is long gone. Then secondly, it is equally time for us to reflect and look inward. And just like Ezekiel has hinted, perhaps there's a need to really consider a lot of what is happening. The world of work really needs to latch on into technology. The wonders of technology, a lot of things have been done remotely. We never thought that a day will become, we can, we will be locked down. But I can tell you, most businesses are being carried out without physical contact, without us being in the physical location where those businesses are. So, I mean, it's a point to ponder for businesses and to ensure that let us begin to migrate. Even in the law profession and uh, in Kenya the other day, a judge sat and then deliver judgments through Skype. So it's something that is before us that is here. Now the internet of it, we need to move and then perhaps to start thinking how a lot of things can be carried out without um, the need to all assemble every day in the physical location. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we are definitely at this time of adaptation and change. As we've referred to, there's a lot of open areas that hadn't been addressed previously, whether that's in the law or in policies. And I think we'll, we'll have to find ways to adapt, hopefully using technology as well. Adora, yeah. final thoughts. I know people are starting to leave. And again, to the participants, thank you for, for the uh, bearing with us. Yes, I, I saw a lot of the questions and I wish I could answer so many of them. What I would say is that we're going through a process of change. What, one thing we can really do is try and address people psychological at this point. We all react to change differently be, be based on our personality type. So people in HR, this is the time to actually show that we are human. We need to look at people psychologically and open up open communication. There is nothing that dialogue cannot resolve. We need to be speaking with staff and coming up with solutions, practical solutions that can help us part the way forward. I think that's the only way forward. I saw a question now on some people have been hired during this period. Imagine someone's resumption date is now. What will a firm do? Dialogue. That's the best thing to do. It wouldn't be fair to, to end a contract that hasn't even started. Talk to them, try and absorb them and do everything you're doing with your firm you know, to them. Tell them this is the situation you found yourself in. But what, you know, what can you do? So this is the best time to be human. This is not the best time to be overreactive. This is the best time to actually try and remember your values, your vision, and what you stand for as an organization. And try as much, it's hard, I know it's hard, but try and apply those principles. That's what I would say. Thank yeah. you, Adora. Ezekiel, final thoughts? I, I think there, there was a, a note about something you have to share with participants, and I know people are starting to leave. So please go ahead. Okay, so um, for those that would want to um, have further engagements with, with MTN, um, let's talk dot ng at mtn.com. Um, you could just send any of your feedbacks um, to that email address and someone is going to get across to you. Let's talk dot ng at mtn.com. My final thought again is to encourage everyone, business owners, I know some employees also joined, um, small business owners, um, large enterprises, let's encourage them um, that what we do during this crisis period um, would actually tell a lot about how we get responses for our employees um, after the period. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Ezekiel. I think my, my reflections, I've learned so much from the discussion. I think, as, as you'll see from the Q&A and from the active participation in the chat, there's a lot of um, reflection on this difficult period. I think both in terms of, as a business, how do you manage um, a very different context? I think particularly for Nigerian businesses that sort of 
that social aspect is so, so important and oftentimes that is done in person. I think we're needing to learn from organizations that have that experience with remote workforce, whether that's a sales force or otherwise. And we need to learn from the practitioners who are really you know, addressing this as it comes, but based on, on the depth of their past experience. So a very big thank you to our panelists for sharing that past experience. Um, as well as to Business Day Digital Dialogues, as well as MTN for, for bringing us together. Um, I'll, I'll just check to see, Frank, if there's any final closing comments before we release everyone. I know we are over time, and I, I hope we're able to have further conversations over the coming uh, weeks and months. He needs to unmute something. Sorry, Frank, I think you're on mute again. Yes. Yeah. I, 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 was going, I was going to say it's been a wonderful conversation. Um, as a business uh, owner and business manager myself, I have uh, learned a lot this morning. I mean, wow. Um, and, and, and I can understand. We can't take all the questions. I, I, I saw the questions flooding in. But uh, thankful to uh, Zikel. He's uh, creating a, a, a process and platform whereby the discussion can happen thereafter. So my thanks, as always, uh, to Adora, Neka, uh, uh, Falabi, and of course, Ezekiel and MTN. Thank We've you all. Great, and I hope for all the hundreds of people who have joined that um, they benefit as well. So over to you, Neka, as you close. Thank you all. Um, I, I think we, we really appreciated the inputs. We'll try and capture some of this, of course, uh, with, with the support of the Business Day team and the MTN team. Um, Please have a good day and please uh, take what you've learned into your work. All right, take care. Thank you. Thank you, All everyone. Right. Good job. Good job, Business Day. Good job, MTN. Good job, Nick. Good job, Thank Polanyi. you. All. Thank good you. job, Frank, Ezekiel, everybody. Dami Lola. Good job. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Blessings. All right. Come on, come on, come